Hello, beautiful people. Welcome. I am Daisy, your hostess. In this video, we continue the explorations of the writings of the author Ralph Waldo Trine in his book, The Man Who Knew. In this exploration, we encounter Jesus as narrated through scriptures, through this author, very light, yet in a very enlightening way, showing somehow that through the parables, there was such depth through the character of Jesus and the science behind his words, that it is no wonder that many have embraced his teachings in the New Age movement. I flip the page now to chapter 11, Rich Toward God. Joshua ben Joseph, the prophet of Galilee, never forgets that he is from and of the people. After the rather distressing incident which occurred when in his ministry he went back to his native village of Nazareth and gave or tried to give in the little village synagogue the same message he had been giving in many parts of Galilee and in Judea to the south, he seems to have broken with his home people and with his family. In a common sense manner, he recognized the inhospitality of their thought and the feeling at times even of hostility. Anyway, he seems not to have gone back. Once when he was near again, an incident occurred which throws additional light upon these facts. At one house where a large gathering had assembled, the press of the people was so great that he and the disciples who were with him could scarcely eat. The account as given by Mark is, quote, And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. End quote. So independent, so unconventional, so unorthodox was he, both in his teaching and in his practices, that many times a great commotion was stirred, and at times there was a considerable wagging of tongues. He mingled with publicans and sinners. He even ate with them. This disgusted the well-to-do, those of social standing, and particularly the scribes and Pharisees. And his teachings to the congregations assembled in the synagogues, humble and so different from the conventional type, gave rise to many questions and discussions, offending some and especially these same scribes and Pharisees. Many a time the question arose, what manner of man is this? These same things were felt undoubtedly by the members of his own family, his mother and his brothers, humble people that they were. They were disturbed by the rumors which were brought to them. They could not understand. They did not like the wagging of the village tongues. They would have him come home rather than risk the disgrace that might come to them. And they were incapable, evidently, of understanding his larger mission and the passion that filled his soul to carry on with it. He was aware of this feeling. He perhaps regretted it, but he could not help it. He perhaps foresaw that sometime he might be compelled even to break with them. His convictions and the absorbing purpose of his life, even if they could not understand, gave him his direction. At the meeting in the same house, there was a clash with some of the scribes and the Pharisees who, hearing of the work that he was doing and the great crowds that were following him, had come or had been sent up from Jerusalem. Later, while he was teaching, there was an interruption. The account is given by Mark. Quote, there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they say unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother and my brethren? For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. End quote. Book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 31 through 35. One grasps here the clear understanding which prompted his statement after his chilly reception the last time he visited his hometown, and how pointed and how definite he makes it. Quote, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. End quote. Book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 4. He understood, but something bigger pushed him on, human needs. When Jesus saw the multitudes, 
he was moved with compassion on them because they were stressed and scattered as sheep not having a shepherd. Human needs and those the most in need. Quote, it came to pass that he was sitting at meat in Levi's house, and many publicans and sinners sat down with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and publicans, said unto his disciples, He eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners. And when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. End quote. The book of Mark, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. He knew their needs. He would make them rich toward God, and then the other extreme, for each has its needs. Quote, Take heed, and keep yourselves from all covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he reasoned within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have not where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my corn and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said unto him, Thou foolish one, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and the things which thou hast prepared, whose shall they be? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. End quote. Book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 15 through 21. Rich toward God he would make him, for the present and for the future, simply but mighty message. There was a universal quality in the message and in the personality of the master that drew him to, and that drew to him those of all conditions who needed help, rich or poor, humble or seemingly great. Occurrences, even as he passed along the highway, are interesting to observe. Quote, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief publican, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the crowd, because he was little of stature. And he ran on before, and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He is gone in to lodge with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have wrongfully exacted aught of any man, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, Today is salvation come to this house. End quote. Book of Luke chapter 19 verse 1 through 9. Rich toward God, and still richer in that voluntarily he chose to do what was right. A beautiful understanding and comradeship between two sympathetic men. A name made immortal by the desire and the determination of an otherwise obscure man to know the best and let it dominate his life. End of chapter 11. Stay right here as we continue on to the next chapter. Yes, that chapter was brief, but the message was quite powerful indeed. Okay, so get comfortable. Here we go. Flipping the page to chapter 12. That wonderful friendship with the 12. Preceding the last phase of the master's life here on earth, a considerable change has taken place. His popularity is not so great as it was the preceding two or more years. He has many devoted followers, but the great crowds have fallen away. The frailty of human nature has played its part. At one time the crowd had been so great, and the enthusiasm so unbounded, that then and there they would take him and make him king. Many a lesser man would have accepted it, would have justified himself and reached out to receive the scepter, 
and transfer the moment, and not foreseeing the trouble to maintain the kingship later on. Many a lesser mind would have succumbed to the dream of grandeur and been willing to give battle to steal, if need be, from another. Again, the real genius of the master asserts itself. His life and his truth have always to do not with a material, but with a spiritual kingdom. This is one reason why many of his former enthusiastic followers have fallen away from him. Some begin to doubt, and justly they think, If he is our deliverer, the Messiah, what has he done? What is he doing? For well nigh three years now we have been following him and nothing has occurred. I am getting nothing out of it. Is he a false leader like others we have put our trust in? The others who have failed us? No well-to-do people, no respectable or rather leading people with an exception here and there are following him. The temple authorities do not endorse him. They do not even believe in him. They think and they openly say that he is an imposter. They are sending spies to watch him in order to get evidence that they may excommunicate him. For he is misleading the people by teaching them things not in their formulated code. He even abuses them, calling them hypocrites, vipers, and children of vipers. Perhaps he has his reasons, but it abodes no good for us. They say that the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests he speaks so bravely of, for good or ill, God only knows, and even the high priest would kill him if they could find a charge sufficient to win the approval of the Roman authorities. They have cautioned him, they have dared him, they have warned him, but instead of being sensible he is growing bolder all the time. They say he is even thinking of going up to Jerusalem to do his teaching and his acts of healing right in their own sacred precincts. Little does he dream of their power. He either does not know or he does not think of the other teachers and prophets who have been killed and quickly killed for smaller offenses. Even his disciples, at least some of the twelve, begin to question and at times to weaken. Their patience is not inexhaustible, any more than their understanding at times of his teachings and his purpose. Where are they getting? What are they getting? They had left all to follow him. He has heard this repeated more than once. Misunderstandings between them, even rivalries begin to take form. It requires at times the utmost patience on the part of the master to cope with their unlettered ignorance. Silently and patiently, he bears with them, hoping always for the best and never losing his faith, but secretly wondering many times whether, when he is gone, they will be grown to sufficient stature to carry on. As he realizes that his time is growing shorter here, the more materially ambitious some of them seem to become. This cost him, at times, no little concern. Always patient and kind and trusting, he finds occasions when it seems necessary to administer an open rebuke. His understanding of human nature is so great, however, that he always bears with them. His supreme faith enables him always to trust them. Even near the closing week, two of the twelve, James and John, sons of thunder, come to him. And one account says the mother came with them and say, Teacher, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall ask of thee. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and one on thy left hand in thy glory. Looking out for their own position, you see, and personal gain. Again, it requires patience. Patience and ingenuity on the part of the master. The account continues. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Luke then later says that this same contention, amounting almost to a quarrel, continued even as they were gathered together at the Last Supper. On the same night, almost in astonishment, but gently as always, Jesus turned to Philip and said, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Once to Peter he said, Are ye also without understanding? Other related occurrences indicated all too clearly what he had to contend with. Then, at or near the end, one betrayed him, one denied him, and all the rest weakened and ran away at least for the time being. 
He had no thought of establishing an organization, a church, only a new knowledge and a new spirit that would bring a new life and a new vitality into the organization already established. Yet he realized how much depended upon the group of twelve he had selected and had so patiently instructed in order that his truth might carry on. It is easy, therefore, to understand his great patience and his almost infinite faith in them. And it is worthy and a fully deserved tribute to say that, later when the real test came, they did prove their first faith, and in a wonderful manner. One of the most beautiful things in all history, with its touches of pathos, is the concern of the master for the friendship and comradeship of this little band of rugged, untutored, but earnest and receptive men as they ate together for the last time, the feast of the Passover. Superb and touching is his gratitude for their companionship and their confidence his concern for their welfare and their safety, his faith that they would measure up to his expectations in using the truth that he would leave with them and through them with the world that he loved and that in a few hours he knew he was to leave. And then his concern for them at the final brief parting scene at Gethsemane near the gate ready. When the officers of the Sanhedrin with the light of their torches come with his betrayer to arrest him, he says, I am he. And he adds for the disciples, If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. We miss much of this close relationship if we do not get the full significance of his opening statement when a few hours before he sat down with them in the upper room at the little inn where they were known and where they had often stayed before to eat with them the last time. Quote, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. End quote. Book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 15. It was there that he gave them his final instructions, his final unfolding of the truth as it pertained to him and to them, the truth which knit them together in a bond of union that he felt would have in it a timeless element. It was there that he threw into the Passover feast a personal element which would, he conceived, make an abiding and compelling memory of their life and work and fellowship together for many years to come. He longs for this union, this comradeship to live on, and above all, for it to bind them to a carrying on of the work, the spreading of his truth which they have labored with him to accomplish. He spoke, as always, in his own and their own Aramaic tongue. Quote, Eat my body and drink my blood. End quote. In the Aramaic idiom, means literally, endure suffering and hard work. It is a familiar form of expression still used by a small branch of the Assyrian people who represent the oldest existing Christian church who think and talk in their native Aramaic tongue and who today live almost identically the same life as did the people among whom Jesus was born and lived and to whom he gave his message. I, through my truth, my new message of life, am the new covenant. This he would establish in their consciousness. Unquestionably, we get the real and full purpose of the Master when we combine the true content of the Aramaic idiom with his injunction to his disciples as they ate together this annual historic meal of their people. It was to be a binding together of their work, of their friendship, their comradeship, when they assembled together in another year to celebrate this same Passover feast. They were to do it remembering him, and to think of this, their last observance of it together. Whether he intended it to be an observance for any others than his immediate group of disciples, no one but he will ever know. No one but he. That it has been frightfully abused in the past, the historic past, we all know. That today dogma has put into it a material content such as the spiritual sense of the master never could have meant, and indeed would mostly bitterly condemn, we all know. As a memorial of his life and his love, of the new covenant of his truth, impregnated always with the spiritual content which he intended, it can be made a very beautiful and sacred and useful sacrament. 
the fullness of its Aramaic meaning, the meaning which he had in mind to live in and to work for his truth, brings with it a saving power, saving for the life of the individual and saving for the life of the world. Quote, I am the light of the world, end quote. He said, but he could be that only as each individual. And a sufficient number of individuals should receive the truth and give it real being and expression in life. In this and in all that went before, the essential genius of the Master and his one continuing purpose had to do with the things of the Spirit. His great concern was that his teachings be so understood. He had to use material terms and illustrations in order to get his meaning and his truth into the material, unspiritual minds of his hearers. And then many times he had to go back and explain to them the real spiritual import. Even his disciples were prone to drag his teachings down and interpret them in a material sense. He had to use terms which they were familiar, terms and objects and forms of expression they knew, even at the risk of making his message liable at times to a material interpretation. End of chapter 12. All right, my dear one. It's going to get real interesting now. Let's see what happens if some of you know the story. So let's head over to the next video where I will continue with chapter 13.